Hey, it's Jeremy from Jeremy.net. Thanks for, uh, for stopping in, checking out my channel. If you would like to support this channel, subscribe to my Patreon. You'll get additional bonus videos and bonus blog posts and content. If you'd like to check out the comics that I create, you can go to comics.jeremy.net. And if you'd like to buy some of them, you can get them at amazon.jeremy.net. So on this video, I'm actually going to be working on some figure drawing work instead of working on comics. Before we get into that, though, one more comic-related thing. just want to let you know that the sketchbook of Morningstar issue 7 is now available in my store at jeremy.net. This sketchbook basically has the upcoming issue, but it's all done over... It's all my rough layouts with the dialogue and the lettering. So if you want a sneak peek, advanced look at what's going to be in issue seven. You can order these from my uh, my store right now, jeremy.net. And I'm only gonna keep the sketchbooks in print until I have the finished full version with the gray tones and the inks printed. So if I sell out of all of these, I got uh, about 50 printed up. If I sell out of all of these before I finish the issue, then I'll get another 50 printed. If I don't sell out of them before I get the book done, then those last ones printed are the only ones that'll be available. Uh, I see Ion Rocks is in the chat. Uh, hi, man. How you doing? So I was just saying, I've got a sketchbook of Morningstar issue 7 out. Jay King's in the, uh, in the chat. How you doing, man? Thanks for, for showing up. Um, well, like I said, sketchbooks available, Patreon, comics, Amazon. So let's get into it. What I've got on the board today are, I've been doing some sketches. As I said, it's fixing bad figure drawings. These are some, I think they were like three minute sketches, two minute sketches from, uh, from figure drawing class. And right now, my class is on a break. So there's a couple of weeks during the winter holidays. Oh, speaking of winter holidays, next week, because we're going into um, Christmas and New Year's, I'm trying to decide. I think that next week I may do the video, and I'll try to schedule it earlier in the week so people will know, but I think next week I'll do it on Saturday instead of Sunday. So I'm probably going to be busy with family stuff during the holidays. And then probably the following week, I'll let you know, but I may skip a week um, during the week of New Year's. So just giving you a heads up on that. Anyway, right now, my figure drawing class that I go to is on a break, and it's really important to me to keep my pencil sharp, metaphorically speaking, in terms of doing figure drawing work. So I want to just take some sketches that I had laying around and just do some studies. Now, the point of these studies is not necessarily like this doodle, this drawing is from uh, this piece right here. This one was from a different page. So these are just some sketches I was doing earlier. Hang on, I gotta adjust the uh, camera a little bit because I realize at this angle, I can't really read the chat. Let's bring it down a little. There we go. That way, if anybody says anything, I'll be able to, uh, to respond. All right, so my goal here, even though this has tonal work in it that the, uh, the rough sketch doesn't have, my goal wasn't to do a more finished drawing to flush them out. My goal was that these drawings are very loose, very rough, quick sketches, and I just wanted to make them feel a little bit more solid. I wanted to go in and add a little bit of, just work on general structure. So when I say general structure, I mean the basic volumes of, let's say I, this piece, this sketch right here in particular, just saying, all right, in terms of proportion, if I say this is the, uh, the length of the torso from head to, uh, to crotch, legs going out that way, then I wanted to just sort of say, all right, let's say that's the midpoint, and the head's up there to just work on basic cubes and cylinders. Now, beyond that, depending on how I feel about the drawing, I may go in and add more detail. See, this is actually going up, this arm's going up a little bit, this arm's going down a little bit. And the head should actually be a little bit more centered. I have it too far over to the side. But 
my goal here for these drawings that I'm, I'm doing right now, and I may, as I go through this, switch, and I'll try to, you know, I'll try to pay attention and say, oh wait, now I'm working on this aspect, now I'm working on that aspect. But right now, the main thing I'm trying to think about is the same thing I'd be working on if I were doing like beginning poses in a figure drawing class, like five minute poses, where I'm just trying to say, what are my front surfaces, side surfaces, top surfaces? Just doing a basic definition of the, the form visually. I'm gonna twist the uh, the waist a little bit so that the pelvis is turned a little bit more towards me. So like the upper torso is pointing a little bit to the left and I'm gonna angle this one so it's pointing a little bit more head on. Let's see. You all showed up in the chat. He said, my issue is to know what I want to put down. Well, you know, that's the, uh, the funny thing. I think that it is skill-wise something that you grow into, knowing exactly what you want on the page before you draw it. And I think that it is definitely something to aspire to. But what I look at figure drawing as is not, figure drawing is a practice unto itself. The point isn't to make good figure drawings, the point is to learn. So the way that I figure out what lines I want to put down is by allowing myself to make mistakes. You know what, speaking of a mistake, it's a mistake drawing. You should always have extra paper underneath because you get a softer stroke and I just realized I'm getting this really crappy tone on here because I'm drawing on top of the last sheet of just cardboard. And there's an extra, like you would be surprised the difference having like 10 or 20 sheets of paper underneath when you're drawing a charcoal pencil because this grain in that stroke is coming from the cardboard. It's not coming from the, uh, the paper. The paper should be smoother. Fortunately, I've got a uh, extra pad behind me Fresh pad and newsprint. Let's see there. And Ion Rock says, I learned to draw an eight and a half by 11 paper sketch pads and I can't really do the typical comic page. Well, you know what's funny? A lot of the, the Filipino artists, uh, I'm trying to think like Alfredo Alcala, um, Alex Nino, um, a lot of great Filipino comic creators. I'm just thinking off the top of my head because I just heard a Proco video and the guy in there was talking about Alex Nino. But um, a lot of them, they didn't have, um, for, for whatever reason, they weren't aware that comic creators in the United States were drawing um, at a larger size, a, a 10 by 15. So they were doing these incredibly beautiful, detailed comic pages, but they were drawing them at the print size of comics. I don't recommend that. But if you feel like what you're comfortable drawing at is eight and a half by 11, then, you know, try drawing at eight and a half by 11. Um, I think the, the reason why it actually is better to draw larger is because your mistakes stand out more. You want to be able, well, it's not even that they stand out more. You have more margin for error. Like, let's say, this is a comic page. And on this comic page, you've got a character whose head is this big and their, you know, their torso is that big. Now, that's a giant head on top of a tiny little stick figure. And you might say, all right, well, let me make adjustments. You can kind of get it kind of closer and closer to what the actual size is, but Let's say that you're drawing a full-sized, let's say you're drawing a full comic page. Let's say that instead the comic page is like this. If you draw that torso and you put that head on top, give it some legs and arms, the difference between something being way out of whack and being kind of in the ballpark, it's like really hard to get it just right. 
Um, but when you're drawing something larger, then you have room to play. Whereas with a, a body this big, you could actually say, all right, well, let me make the head a little bit larger in this case. Or, you know, maybe make it a little bit wider. You have more room to play with. Or you say, all right, now that I've looked at the rest of the figure, this head is still too big. The margin for error, the error, the amount of space you have to make corrections, you have a lot more space. Whereas with this, you might say, all right, let me make just a little bit bigger. And you make this tiny head just a little bit bigger, and now it's gargantuan. You make it a little bit smaller, it's pea-sized. But you don't have as much room to adjust size. Whereas with this, you've got a much larger range to make corrections, simply by working larger. Um, and I do think that your, your mistakes will jump out at you more when you're drawing big, but I think that that's a good thing because I am also a fan, as I've mentioned before, of confronting your mistakes. Um, it's okay to make mistakes. In fact, that's kind of the whole point of doing the art is, the point of doing practice, where it's, whether it's figure drawing studies or just working on your comics, is that you get to crash and burn and figure out what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong, which comes back to the question before of knowing what you want to put down, which by the way, see, the strokes I'm getting now are a lot smoother. They don't have as much of that rough texture that uh, it had now that I've got a whole pad underneath. And this paper is a little bit rougher because it's an old pad. You can see it's a little bit, I don't know if you can tell color-wise from the video, but it's a little bit yellow compared to this fresh pad. Like this is an old pad I've had laying around for ages. But um, on this one, you know, I should probably even push this a little bit further because I don't feel like I'm getting that sense that I wanted, that twist. And this does not really feel like you're looking at... Now I'm just boxing this in more than I would normally because I want to be able to see the side views that I'm doing because I feel like I'm not giving this pelvis enough of a twist. So I'm drawing a little bit boxier than I would want to do. I would normally draw much lighter, but I wanna, this is more, again, the idea of studying is making mistakes and analyzing this. Like this is a drawing that I might possibly do two or three times just to try and figure out what it is that I'm doing wrong. But the main thing here is that it didn't feel like it was twist, twisting so that the pelvis was facing forward like I wanted. So I'm going in there and just boxing that in a little bit more. And there should be a little bit more of a squish here. Like you've heard of squash and stretch in animation Or at least I presume you have. But the idea of like, if you look at simple animation, one of the first things they do is, one of the earliest tests is like doing a, um, a potato sack or some sort of inert object or a ball bouncing. But the idea that like with a bouncing ball in animation, you know, when it's bouncing up after, it, like when it hits the ground, when it bounces up and it's got the most energy, you actually can move from being completely round to slightly stretching some artists can exaggerate it quite a bit, but the idea of it springing, this would happen closer to the surface. Like as soon as it has the impact, that's what's got the most energy. And then it slowly returns to its normal spherical state as it's losing energy. And then as it hits the ground, you can have it squish a little bit. If you're doing realistic proportions, if you're doing something really cartoony, you can have it really splat on the ground. So it's an animation principle. But I think it also applies when you're drawing the human form that if you stretch one side, then there's not necessarily squish, but compression on the, uh, the other side. So it's like this side is coming inward as this side is coming outward. And I realized that in that original, it's kind of there in my little rough sketch that I did in class, but I realized that this little piece that I'm doing here doesn't have that. And I also realize I'm really not expressing this sense of a, a turn. The fact that you're seeing 
on this upper torso. This is getting messy because I'm diagramming all over it. But I'm not really, I wasn't, I just realized I wasn't expressing the, the sense that the torso is turned so that you're seeing a front side and a side side, for lack of a better word. Because really what I'm drawing is an upper torso or rib cage, a little bit of a, a top on it, and a lower torso, pelvis, and I'm only adding a, just a tiny bit of a side to it because I wanted it to feel mostly straight on. Although I realized the fact that there's so much shading on this side or that I drew it with a tone makes it confusing because visually, if you look at that, you're like, why is there shadow on both sides? Because there shouldn't be shadow on both sides. This, if this is the side that light's coming from, if anything, on the lower surface, on the, the pelvis, there shouldn't really necessarily be tone, but there should definitely be that this side should be the lightest side. And what's funny is, and really, I don't even need to necessarily be concerned with that at this stage, because these aren't really drawings where I'm getting into tonal values. I'm thinking of this stuff purely in terms of structure, in terms of a uh, surface, just very simple blocks and cylinders. Because I feel like that is something that I don't do enough, is just doing simple structural volumes. Because the more I do that, when I do do more comp, when I do draw more complex forms, that hopefully they will still have that sense of volume and structure. That's what I want to improve at. So I try to remember to do more, more drawings like this, just for, for practice, just to keep my, uh, my sense of, of structure. I can't remember if it was last week or the week before, but someone was talking about losing the energy in a, uh, a rough sketch. Like, I definitely feel like this little sketch that I'm drawing here doesn't have anywhere near the energy of this one. And there's a certain immediacy, but again, that's one of the reasons why I strongly advocate actually going to figure drawing classes and drawing from a live model, because there's a certain there's just the energy you get from the person in the room taking the pose that's different than you just making it up. Well, ideally you wanna get good enough at drawing from the figure that when you have a made up figure, whether it's in a comic book page or whether you're just doodling, that you can capture the energy that a real life model would. Yeah, I don't think there's much to say or do with that one. Uh, let's see here. I kind of like this little sketch here at the bottom and feel like redrawing that one because it has a lot of foreshortening to it, which is very hard. Just the, the rhythms of having the one leg sticking out, coming towards you, well, diagonally towards you, then having the other leg bent in front, but then also having the arms coming out. I think I have a vague sense memory of drawing that picture in class and feeling like there was so much foreshortening there that it was just kicking my ass. I mean, just the foreshortening of the torso alone, having the, uh, the upper torso leaning back like that. Well, the whole torso leaning back.
even here. It's like I feel like I'm fighting to keep this thing on the tracks. Yeah, this is a tough one. A lot of foreshortening. Trying to force myself to uh, to slow down a little bit and take my time. Which in a way is counterintuitive to the exercise because one of the things that, that I was really thinking in doing these sketches, normally if I have a more refined drawing and that one has a lot of mistakes, I feel like I'm going in and doing a lot of corrective work. Whereas with rough sketches, stuff that are like five minute poses or shorter, it's almost like I'm using these as an opportunity opportunity to replace the the figure drawing that I'm not going to during these next couple of weeks, you know, being uh, off from my regular class and looking at these is just all right, rough poses for me to to work from. Put this down, blow my nose a little bit. Oh, everyone's got a little bit of a holiday sniffler cold around me these days. Pardon me. Mm. See a few more comments in the chat. Jay King says, my drawings are looking stiff. How to get a natural look. Aaron says, cool figures, man. Thank you. UL says, curves, all about curves to make the illusion of flow. Well, when it comes to, let's start with the stiff figure thing. I do not draw in a way that I think lends itself to organic looking figures. My figures are overly boxy. Whether I'm doing finished pieces or or just doodles, I tend to draw with a lot of straight lines instead of drawing really curvy. Um, I think if you really want to have your forms feel look organic, I would look up an artist named, uh, named Claire Wendling. Her work, um, she's done a lot of work in animation, um, concept design, illustration in general, amazing artist. Um, check her work out because her work feels very structural, but also feels very organic. Um, the way that I try to loosen up my figures when they feel a little bit stiff is so let's say you've got a drawing and you're looking at it and it feels stiff. You might, let's say, lightly, I'll leave this here, but let's say that I'm just drawing, I don't know, a really blocky, let's just say, a woman with her arms folded. Now, my stuff tends to be, I have a lot of straight lines in my work. So what I will do is I'll go over that sketch, whether it's a finished drawing or a rough drawing, and I might go in and erase lightly. Probably works better with a uh, kneaded eraser, but Let's just say that you, or actually, oh, this is even better. Because I'm drawing in charge, I can just smear it out a little bit. Now what you can do is you can go back in and look at the structural elements. Let's say the, um, the, the most important place, if you've got stiffness, the best place to fix it is in the, um, the upper torso and lower torso. The, uh, the rib cage and the pelvis. If you can try and add 
a curve and then a straight. The idea is that contrast, you don't want rhythm just for the sake of rhythm. Like if you make a curvy line, but it's very repetitive, that is just as stiff as a straight line or a bunch of straight lines that are repetitive. What you want is to have contrast. You want to have long and short or straight and curvy. And even this, these are too similar. What would be better is to have something be straight and curvy or straight and then a couple of curves that are irregular. So going back to your stiff drawing, let's say you've got one and you add a nice curve for the upper rib cage and a, a sharp line for the hip, then maybe another longer curve if she's got like on a, a large dress going down. Maybe you add some frills underneath. And now this is me just making up a drawing. The idea is that you wanna look at whatever the figure is that you're drawing, whatever their character, whatever their costume, and you wanna look for places to add that variation. Like maybe, let's say you get up to the top of the shoulder and you may decide, instead of having a sweeping arc from the, uh, the trapezius coming down from the shoulder, coming down from the neck into the shoulder, you might instead intentionally put an angled line in there. Maybe have the curve coming off of the, the neck curved and then have a sharp line going to the shoulder. Putting in a little bit of rhythm and doing something similar on the opposite side. You might decide, okay, let me have the shoulder round out, but then maybe have it straight down to that elbow and then curve in again. And then maybe on the underside, you maybe have another curve and have this be a short curve, sort of like a little bit of a belly pressing against that, and then a straight line coming out from that curve. You know, maybe there's a, a little belt or a tie that she's got here. And those ankles come together into little points. Bring those feet together like that. So when it comes to having stiff drawings, if it's stiff, you don't have to throw out the whole drawing. What you can do is redraw on top of it and add some flow. So that's the thing. That's when The fact that you even sense that the drawing is stiff is a good sign. The fact that you can look at a drawing and say, oh, something's not right with it. The first step is being aware of a problem. And the second step is saying, well, what can I try to alleviate that problem? If it's too stiff, you need to add some more rhythm to it. So I could have just said, hey, my drawing's too stiff. I could have just said, add some rhythm. That would have been the, uh, the quick, short answer. But um, I think that, that also adds to uh, the, the thing that you all brought up about curves making the illusion of flow. And yes, I think that the flow is definitely curves, but it, the rhythm is curves and straights or the, the length of the angle of those curves, and adding a, adding a back and forth, an interplay between those. Like to me, that's a more nuanced flow because I am probably, I definitely am on the angular side, kind of like a Mike Mignola, the guy who created Hellboy. Um, I think that it's possible to have be on the much more curvier side and everything might feel a little bit mushy. The beauty is when you can meld the two and have them go back and forth at interplay. And that's something that I am still working towards, reaching towards. Let's see. Aaron says, uh, for me to avoid stiff figures and to keep the energy, I try to find the line in the figure that defines the gesture. And I render the whole figure, even the hatching, in a way that reinforces that line. That's a great point. Um, whether you're doing charcoal pencil or whether you're like doing something that's like ink hatching like let's say I've got this arm that's coming towards you this forearm you could tone it you could just tone it by putting tone on the underside or you can intentionally add curved tone and curve that tone around the volume of that uh that cylinder that's an important thing to have, almost as if, like, let's say you're just drawing a cylinder on its own coming towards you. If you were going around 
if you're doing sort of a cross axis, a contour line, almost like a, a pipe that um, has like a serrated uh, surface to it, you know, going around the, those curves, you can do that with tone and that will very much enhance. That's a great, uh, great recommendation, Aaron. Um, you can definitely enhance the sense of volume by using that in either hatching or in soft tones. I think I may have drawn completely over the area where I was going to put this, uh, this figure in. Let's see. Doing all of these little doodles around the area that I'm drawing, not leaving as much area for the thing that I started drawing itself. But yeah, as you can see, my first instinct, even when I started drawing this, is I started drawing ahead, but it very much went blocky and I had to go in and give it a little more ellipse oval shape to it. And even this, looking at it now, you know, I'm gonna start over because I'm looking at this and it's out of proportion. There's things that I'm not happy about it, like this arm has a more of a break and a rhythm. Speaking of rhythm, it goes down a little bit more and then back up. And there's a shoulder that's up here. I feel like maybe because I started drawing and then sort of ran away from it for a little bit was tossed all of the nice subtleties and nuances that were in that one. Let's see what's on the page after this. Ah, something a little bit more structural. I'm gonna take another stab at that uh, this drawing. And then this one is one where proportion, I may have worked really hard on rendering the lighting in the, the legs and defining volume on the lower half, but the proportion, the upper part of the body is way off. So, let's see here. Blowing my nose again, excuse me. And Aaron also says, uh, yes, I foc and I focus my rendering and detail in the area or the flow that traverses along the gesture and downplay other areas in the figure that doesn't help the flow in the gesture too. Yeah, that's an important thing. You have to remember that if you're trying to draw everything that you see, if you're in a figure drawing class, or if you're drawing out of your head, you may know that a certain anatomical structure is there. It's okay to edit the figure in order to make the story you're trying to tell convincing. Like, let's say that you're just trying to draw, for whatever reason, let's say it's on a pelvis, you've got a pelvis curving back this way, and maybe there's a protrusion in the hip bone that makes a form which feels like it should be curving this way, Maybe there's a protrusion that give me, the way it appears will make it curve in an opposite way. You can eliminate those things, or you can decide to, even if it's not the way it would look from that angle, make it fit what you're trying to describe with the figure. Like, it's just the idea of like leaving out certain details if they fight with the overall form of the figure. Because you want to create a certain, well, flow. You want the whole thing to flow together. And if you're putting in things, trying to put everything in that should be there, sometimes those things will fight against what you're trying to express. This isn't a pretty, this isn't a particularly thought out doodle. I'm just free drawing out of my head here. Um, but yeah, you kind of want to, not kind of want to, you definitely want everything to work in concert with each other. That's something that I still struggle with, is the idea that um, trying to make sure that everything like that, all of the anatomical details, the muscle, the lighting, all of this should be in service of the entire figure. You don't want these pieces to jump out, and even if they're well rendered, 
to fight with the, the larger form. We want everything to feel subservient to the whole. And that's something that as just in figure drawing class on a regular basis, I am constantly fighting to remind myself to do. So this time I'm gonna try and not get distracted and at least get my gesture down. Because I think that was the thing before, as I started drawing and talking and fell out of the, uh, the gesture stage. And it's like, if I don't even get my gesture down, then this thing is definitely not going to fly. I'm trying to relate... feet and the knees and you can add a little bit of flow of up and then down and then have the foot coming out and I will tell you I am not embarrassed by saying that I'm not as happy with these doodles as I um, I'm not as happy with them, as pleased with them as I normally am with my figure drawing work. This is the reason why I'm doing these studies is because I know that when I'm in between or in a period when I don't have class, that I still need to pay attention to doing basic study of the form. So yeah, I don't think like I'm, I'm looking at these and there's lots of like, oh, oh, that's not working. That's that's okay. In fact, that's something that I notice when I'm in class is a lot of other artists, usually younger artists, they get really frustrated that their drawings aren't coming out well in figure drawing class. But figure drawing should be a safe place to crash and burn because you're trying to study, you're trying to learn. And if you put pressure on yourself to just say, I have to make good drawings. And if they don't come out well, then I have failed and I've wasted my time here. Um, you haven't wasted your time because you've come out and you've grappled with things that are challenging you creatively. Um, things in your skill set that aren't, oops, bump the camera, that you have yet to master. And anytime that you sit down and you work at these issues and try to grow as an artist, that's not time wasted. So I feel like you need time to just mess up, to screw up and try to figure out what you want to do, how you want to make something better. Because it's one thing to have a, an instructor look over your shoulder and say, here, this muscle is too long. This, um, this joint is facing the wrong direction. It's another thing to learn how to fix those things on your own. I think that that's actually the greater skill and that's one of the things that's really worthwhile to spend time on your own work just not just saying, okay, this, is, this isn't coming out well, this figure's too stiff, but actually trying different tasks, trying different approaches to fix those figures or to analyze what it is that you're doing wrong. The ability to learn to self-correct will take you a long way. And I think the thing I'm struggling with right now is self-correction while drawing, while talking at the same time. Not that I wanna, don't wanna talk to you guys, but I realize this pose is one that I had a hard time with the first time I drew it. And drawing it now, it's just... Because this pose has a lot of subtleties to it with all of the overlap and the slightly reclined figure. This is something right here that, uh, like, um, like Aaron had mentioned earlier about using tone. That I can just, if I want to reinforce the fact that this thigh is coming forward. Although I put too much in here and I did not, this knee is really not thought out. In fact, that might be the reason why I wanted to redraw this, because the knee is just not convincing or communicating as a knee. 
I think the challenge is putting in the rounded structure and then squaring it off. Yeah, this one isn't going to be me going in and doing something lightly and tonally beautiful. This is more like me going in and working out the structure of what's wrong. And that's okay sometimes. Sometimes instead of doing a pretty drawing, you just got to go in there and say, all right, let me bulldoze over this thing with blocky forms and say, what is this supposed to be? What am I pretending to say versus what do I want to say? <laughs> Excuse me. I'm allergic to crappy drugs. Let's see. More folks in the chat. Let me scroll back up. Let's see. You all says, I also find to make people less stiff, looking to turn hips different from shoulder and head. Yes, that's the, uh, the concept called contrapposto. Uh, I, don't I don't lock people to a set proportion, just trying to keep real if that's what I'm looking for. Um, yeah, contrapposto is a concept from the, uh, the Italian old masters. Uh, Michelangelo used it a lot in sculpture, Da Vinci used it a lot in painting, but it's to put simply, if you have a figure, let's say you have one just, someone standing just static, pelvis, rib cage. Now as opposed to standing static, you can add some energy by having one hip up and one hip down. And furthermore, not just having them up and down, but to have them moving forward and backward in space. Like let's say you take the hip that is up, you might have that hip moving towards the viewer. And then the, uh, the side that is moving down, have that facing away. I'm boxing them off instead of making them rounded like they were in this one. So you can, just to emphasize the sense of the, the turn. And this is something that's covered in um, George Bridgman's books. He has one called, because um, again, they have the complete George Bridgman, but in the individual books, he has one that's called George Bridgman's Guide to Life Drawing. And on that one, he talks about contrapposto as a great technique for, uh, for adding rhythm and flow to the figure. And you can even carry that, not just even, but you should carry that all the way up to the head. So let's say you've got these opposing feelings you know, pelvis turn this way, rib cage turn that way. Then you could have the head turning back straight toward the middle or even have the head turning slightly back the other way, maybe up a little bit. And the thing is, I came in and I drew those blocky. You can come in and then round them off. A lot of times I will lightly block in things as a squared thing to try it as a squared form to try and get a sense of volume. And then I'll come in and I'll round those off. So you can take something like this blocky form and you can round it into a more spherical uh, pelvis. You know, these things, you know, you don't want to think of them as concrete forms. You want to be able to manipulate them as you go. Um, let's see, I see, uh, oh, John Ursic showed up, great uh, color artist and comic creator, John Ursic's in the chat, thanks for stopping by, um, and thank you, he said, Gesundheit. tight, yes, thanks, man, um, and he said, yeah, I might need to draw through the hip there, that thigh 
coming straight up is a real challenge. Yeah, if you guys haven't heard the concept of drawing through, it's simply drawing something as though it is a clear or a glass object you can see through. There's one thing you could draw, say, a cube. I mean, this is the simplest example. Is There's a cube versus a cube where you're drawing through it. And when you draw through it, the same way that I drew this line, I can look and say, this line would be a parallel line. This line will be parallel to this bottom line. This line will be parallel to that line, which, I mean, you would, that one wouldn't be hidden. But the idea is drawing the hidden lines and you can use those hidden lines to make something that feels a little bit more, not a little bit more, and hopefully a lot more accurate. So, and this is something that you can use for any cube, cylinder, sphere to try and work out the structures. And you know what, John makes a really good point. I should probably go all the way into this pelvis what probably would be smart would just be to erase the legs altogether and just draw the pelvis by itself and work out where the uh, the thighs are attaching. That actually, if we're talking about drawing through, you might as well do it right and just really get in there. Which means that that would actually put this over a little bit more. I mean, the thing is you can draw through forms and then come back and erase parts that you've drawn through. Give yourself a little bit of a uh, room and rhythm to uh, to go back and continue what you're drawing. So some, you know, not every line you put down has to stay in the piece. I mean, there's a reason why we have erasers and you can put lines in just as a, a placeholder or as a, let's say an architectural detail to help you figure out what it is you're doing, where you're going with the drawing. Let's see. I see uh, somebody asked about the spelling and in the chat, uh, John put in contrapposto, which I think that's the, uh, there might be two T's in uh, posto, but other than that, I think that is how you, uh, you spell it. And yeah, there's a lot of great examples. If you just Google contrapposto online, um, see uh, Willie Reed's in the chat and three, furry, I think also. Thanks for uh, for stopping by, guys. Thanks for uh, for joining me. And I will tell you, normally I would sit and redraw this drawing like three or four times, working out the details because that's usually my personal approach when I'm working on a drawing and I'm not happy with it. I don't get particularly bored. I just will keep doing it and doing it. You know, quick question in the chat. Do you want to see me keep working through and trying to fix this one? Or do you want me to move on to another pose? I figure I'll let you guys decide because I would just keep working on it and draw different versions of it till I, I feel I've figured out what's wrong with it. But if you guys are getting bored, I can uh, grab a different pose. Oh, well, John also corrected. Well, yeah, you, you it's um, it's one word versus two, but... You still have the spelling pretty close. <laughs> ah, well, it, I'm glad that you're there in the, the chat to check it out for me. It's great. It's like having my own Wikipedia for me as, as I'm going. Let's see. So John recommends doing a, a new version larger. And yeah, that's the thing I was saying. Uh, yeah, it's tough. It's a tough one. We always find ourselves drawing. <clears throat> and yeah, actually the fact that I'm drawing it so small makes it challenging. In fact, that this one is actually even a little bit smaller than the original. And as I had mentioned before, drawing large gives you a chance, an opportunity to, uh, you have more margin for error. So I'm gonna adjust the camera a little bit. Cause I'm going horizontal now. There we go. So let's try this. In fact, I think what I'm going to have to do is loosen up and not look at the, um, the, the sketch that is my source as much. It's something that I was talking about um, during like one of the last nights of class 
last week with my instructor, Carl Ganas, I had mentioned how when I, in class, when I do a bad drawing, I will go in and make corrections. And the corrections seem to come out much better than the, uh, you know, than the original drawings I'm doing in class. And I'm like, my big question was, why is it that I can sit here, analyze a drawing, and fix it when I can't seem to do the actual correct drawing the first time, when the, the model's right there in front of me? And part of it, I think, he, well, what he pointed out was that I am spending a little bit too much time observing and not directly focusing on the volumes I'm creating on the paper because I'm not doing a one-to-one -one replication of what the model is doing up there. I am telling a story on the page. I'm editing reality. And if you get a little bit too wrapped up in the reality that's in front of you, you might lose the reality that you're trying to, to create, trying to, to lay down in paper. So I realized that that might be part of what's happening here with these sketches. Also the fact that the model had a very interesting thing with the shoulders being appearing almost even, but it's because one shoulder, this shoulder was, her torso I think was turned so it was down a little bit, but she pulled her shoulder up a little bit. So the way that structurally, the way I remember it in class was that the torso angled down slightly and the model pulled her shoulder up. And this one was just up. So in the end, they appear parallel, but they appear parallel with one shoulder being pulled up. And that gives a really interesting rhythm, but it's also very, very subtle. So a lot of subtleties to, uh, to try and fight through. Now, fight through is the wrong way to look at it because I always, you know, I try not to think of this process as a combative one. Whether a drawing is coming out good or horrible, I, I, I yeah, I try to keep it in terms of a, uh, it's an analytical process but it's also sort of a meditative process, meditating on what is form, what is volume, what is perception, how am I describing these things, what am I really trying to say? So again, the, the suggestion from John about drawing through the forms, I think before even getting in and drawing that that uh, that thigh, that it would behoove me to just work out this pelvis. It seems like for this drawing, the secret is all in the pelvis. Uh oh. One of our cats just walked into the art department. And you know how a dog will want to play fetch and it'll come up and bring a ball when it wants to play with you? Our cats are the most dog-like cats I've ever seen. And they will very much come in and say, hey, I want to play, I want your attention, here is a toy, it's time to get down. And I can see her out of the corner of my eye like with the toy saying, how aggressive do you want me to get? Little monkey, come here. Mm. All right, she's like, no, nah, no, nah, if you're not playing, I'm not coming up. I'm surprised because our other cat is usually the one that I like to joke is my art director. And she usually likes to come in sit on the drawings, she likes to come up, climb onto the artboard while I'm working. Yeah, this pelvis is really challenging because there's also a little bit of a twist in the hips. In fact, see, that's one of the things that's killing me. Now that I look at this, there's contrapposto just in this simple pose, in the sense that, let me see if I can diagram this up here. Well, hang on, cats. Shh. 
Hush, right, go do something. Uh, in this simple, just in this, let me see if I can simply work out what I'm observing, which is this upper torso is sort of coming, that's too extreme. Let's say if this is the surface, the front surface of the rib cage without the breasts, and it's coming towards us, and it's coming down. Now, the lower part, or let's say the midsection, going down into the pelvis, is coming a, not completely straight on, but more straight on. So there's a twist here, but, and, there's a twist here, and it looks like angle-wise, it's shifting, I don't know if it's slightly more down, but then when we get to the pelvis itself, there's a twist again, and the pelvis is turning sort of away more. So there's a serpent, a very subtle serpentine twist here where the path just in here, just in this, is going, you know, a little bit away, then a little bit towards. And then back away again. And I realized just in this little drawing I had gotten here that I'm missing that twist. Now, the thing about contrapposto is that when you get it in a really subtle sense in a figure like, like this, those are the things I think that make drawings feel elegant. This goes back to the earlier conversation about curves and rhythm because those twists and turns don't have to be dramatic twists and turns. Sometimes the really subtle ones are the ones that really make you feel like a drawing is alive and living and breathing. Cause it's not doing this dramatic cartoony over the top twist. It's just doing something really subtle. And I realized in all the drawings I did before, and even in this one, I didn't even get that much down. So let's see. More comments in the chat. Aaron says, drawing for me is a lot like an addiction, a bad one. Going through a staggering high degree of frustration and pain for a very tight for a very tiny satisfaction or pleasure um it's sure the pelvis that made elvis legendary um <clears throat> i will say that all drugs are good all things are good in moderation that doesn't necessarily mean that i moder i'm moderately draw i sh wish i should i should could draw more but I've really learned to stop. Like when I talk about the mistakes that I'm making here and the fact that I'm drawing this two or three times, it's awkward to be doing this in front of you because it really is watching me fail on the page. But I feel like that's one of the things that I, I want to share is that in order to get to the good drawings, like I was talking to some artists the other night and they were looking through some of my comic book pages and like, oh, that looks cool. Um, I was at a little hangout with a friend of mine and he just had a little artist get together. And I was appreciative that they liked the work, but when I, I was talking about just how much time I spend studying and reworking and trying to figure out how to get the form to do what I want to look right, um, but I don't look at these things unto itself, these studies and these failures, I don't feel a large sense of pain in doing them. And I feel like that's the main thing I can offer in my YouTube channel and in this community that we have here where we're sharing this time in making artwork is that I'm sharing the fact that I'll make, try something and I'll make a mistake. I'm like, okay, well, what can I learn from that mistake? How can I do this better? Like... This subtle thing about the serpentine aspect of the uh, the torso, the contrapposto that's happening in this pose that isn't a standing pose with a big hip twist. 
Um, it's another way, A, it's another way of exploring contrapasto, but B, I wasn't really aware of it. I may have been aware of it on a subconscious level. I had to have been to draw it in this first sketch. But on an analytical level, being able to observe it and see why it's there and to understand that when I'm doing these other drawings, the fact that I was failing to communicate this in this drawing and the drawing that I did on the other sheets, it broadened my sense of awareness. So I'm not mad that I did that I was wasting time. I feel like, oh wait, I know to look for these things more in other drawings now. This whole process for me is just, I'm always trying to just open my mind and say, what can I take from this? What can I learn from this? How can I use this to make me a better artist? Um, and realistically, I could just sit here and just work on, I mean, I was gonna move on to other poses, but I'm realizing even now, just sitting and, and drawing, uh, just drawing torsos and breaking them down into basic boxes and ellipses and egg shapes, that alone is a very worthwhile endeavor to help improve my sense of, of volume, proportion, improve my drawing. Let's see here. And John Ursick says, uh, it looks like her left ass che cheek might be lifted off the ground or the contact point might be shifted back on that cheek. It's hard for me to place it too. Um, hang on. The cats are getting insistent that they want to play. Well, it looks like we are at a little over an hour here. I'm probably not going to finish the study of this, but I'll draw for like another five, five or 10 minutes or so. And uh, yeah, I think that, um, well for me actually, it looks like this one is the one that's solid. Oh yeah, I was gonna, I don't know if you meant to say her right ass cheek. Um, well, it would be her left. Um, it's just on my right side. I see what you're saying. Yeah, it does look like she's crossing over and that ass cheek is probably coming off the ground a little bit, which again is reason why your suggestion about drawing through was so important. Because I do need to get that sense of the uh, what the pelvis is doing. So let me go back in here and see if I can mimic a little bit of what I have going on in that little thumbnail there. I'm gonna rib cage down a little bit more. Get that little shift in the plane. Like I said, I'll be on for a few more minutes. So if you guys have any more questions before we wrap it up, hit them up in the chat. And I'm probably just gonna block this out. And not get a whole lot farther than that. Yeah, sometimes in order to get down to the elegant part of the figure, and you know, Jimmy, the thing you had asked earlier about having figures that are stiff, this is extremely blocky. But once you understand the structure of what you're drawing, you can go and you can add that sensual, that rhythm, those lines back into the form. So sometimes you do have to go blocky in order to come back to the rhythm. Because you can't put rhythm in if you don't understand where the forms are going. And that's sort of the uh, the mistake and the thing that I was battling with. It's funny that I felt like this drawing, the whole reason why I wanted to redraw this one was because I didn't finish the hand. It felt like the, the arm, her, what would be her right, the hand is there, the shoulder is there, there's no elbow and they're disconnected and floating. And then also the fact that this leg, her left leg, which is on our right side, doesn't 
feel like it syncs up with her pelvis correctly and the knee is completely misshapen. So those are the things that made me want to fix this. But in sitting here and just tackling this drawing, there's so much to learn here that I'm like, wow, there's all these different things that I missed. And as I'm trying to correct other things, I'm realizing there's all these other subtleties to observe in the form. And if you don't take the time to analyze your own work, to dive in, to, to muck around in it and say, what's going on? Not just this drawing sucks, but why is it not a good drawing? If you don't take the time to muck around in your work, you're not gonna discover these things. And discovering these things is what's going to allow you when you go forward in the future and do other drawings to make them better. So, you know, muck around in your drawings, break stuff. I mean, look, I'm sitting here doing bad drawings in front of a bunch of people on the internet. Don't be shy, it's okay. I mean, I, I don't mind a little public humiliation you guys don't have to broadcast this online. You guys can just go and do it by yourself and not show anyone that you're doing it. But do it. Take the time to dig into your drawings. Don't be afraid to do a drawing 10 different times. Say, oh, well, this sucks. That sucks. That's not working. As long as you ask yourself while you're doing it, what is it that's not working? Um, yeah, take that, take that time. Because sometimes... It, yeah, there's only so much that having someone looking over your shoulder to help can do. Sometimes you really do just have to sit there and bang your head against the wall, so to speak, and really ask the drawing what, like ask the drawing, why is this volume not convincing? Is it an anatomical problem? Is it a problem with my perception of basic volumes? Um, sometimes it's a perspective drawing, I'll, a perspective problem. I'll just draw a form and be like, oh wait, I didn't draw through it. And now, you know, one side is longer than it should be. Um, something's out of proportion. Now see, looking at this, I can see where it's challenging. What I should do is probably curve this slightly to accommodate the fact that, again, she is gonna be lifting the leg that's on this side. So maybe I'll dip this a little bit. And you know what that gives us? You know what that gives us? That gives us more contrapposto. Gives us more curve, more turn. So we're getting super structural in this. All right. UL says, how do you put your flair on the image so it's in your style? Um, well, I've got a great answer to that question. I don't try. Um, I've mentioned this in other videos before, but I'm a big fan of Ashley Wood, um, Bill Sienkiewicz, David Mack, guys who do a lot of expressionistic artwork. And at a certain point in studying their work, I realized the reason why they can do these impressionistic, or no, expressionistic artwork where it's got like splashy lines and distorted figures is because they understand the structure of the form underneath very, very well. And once I've realized that it comes down to how well do you understand the form and the structure, I don't really care. Like I do feel like I have a style. But my goal is let me try and make it a good solid drawing first. And then whatever comes out on top of that will be my natural style. So I'm not consciously trying to impress a style upon my figure drawings or my comic book work. I'm focusing on form, volume, obviously storytelling. But in terms of the actual drawing, form, volume, anatomy, and proportion. Those are the things I'm working on when I'm drawing. And if I can get those things, then I don't care. It's, my drawings are gonna look like my drawings. The thing, you, the thing you don't necessarily realize is you can actually can't get away from your own style. You may not feel like you have a style, but you do. You don't see it yet because you draw, you, all you're seeing is a lot more of the things that are just wrong. But once you fix the, the fundamental structural flaws in those drawings, 
And I'm not saying that your work is wrong or bad. I don't know. I haven't looked at it. But what I'm saying is if you're concerned about style, the better you get at locking in the fundamentals of form and figure and anatomy, the more you will see that everything in the figure that's beyond just getting those things right is what is your style. It'll happen naturally. Don't worry about it. Don't force it. Um, Aaron says, uh, Jeremy, in all your years of drawing and the skills you've amassed, how much do you think of those skills that you apply are critical? Whoops, I'm shaking the camera. <laughs> are critical and conscious and how much of it is in instinctive and subconscious? Wow, that is a deep, heavy question. Um, I would say, well, that's the thing. When it comes to the subconscious, I don't really know what I don't know. Um, I guess I really do feel like a lot of it is conscious because like when you see me working in the, when you see the videos where I work through my thumbnails then I work through my layouts and then I work through actual, you know, inking the pages. I go through a lot of thought process about working out the figure and the form, what they're doing and saying. Um, I would actually say that right now, very little of my process is instinctual. I feel like a lot of it is me thinking about the decisions that I'm making and trying to look at all of the bad decisions I've made in the past in visual storytelling and trying to improve those. But, as I spend more time thinking about those things and making conscious decisions, what happens is I slow down sometimes because I'm really thinking through and saying, how can I fix every little thing? And then as things start being fixed, I loosen up and I speed up a little bit. What happens is I don't feel like I am an artist who has a consistent pace. I have an ebb and flow. Like one issue will go really, really fast. One issue, I'm going through tons of reference, I'm going really slow. Another issue, I'll say I took too long on that, let me just speed up and fly through. And when I speed up, I notice what happens is I slow down, I work on the craft, I think about every decision. And then each time I speed up, I bring more of that thought process with me and it carries over to the quicker, more instinctive work. And what happens is I'll do a, a batch of work that's more instinctive, subconscious, done very quickly, and I'm not overthinking it. And I will do that batch. And then I will come back and look at those things and say, well, what is still not good enough? What am I still not happy with in this? And I slow down again and I work on those things. And then I speed up again. So it's an ebb and a flow. It's not a consistent thing. Because I would like to believe that I'll still be drawing 40 years from now, and then I'll still be learning 40 years from now. I'm not drawing with the goal of, in five years, I'm gonna know everything I need to know, and my style's gonna be set. I'd like to think that I'm gonna keep evolving and changing in terms of style, in terms of skill, craftsmanship, all of these things, and I will continue to evolve, and that, that's gonna be a lifelong evolution. So hopefully, that's appealing to you. Because I don't like, I'd, if I were just knew everything I needed to know, I'd be bored. I like the, the challenge. So I think that's it for now. We've had a nice good session. You've got a chance to sit with me while I'm working on uh, some figure drawing stuff instead of some comic stuff. So next week we'll be back to some comics. <clears throat> like I mentioned before at the start, if you got in late, Morningstar issue seven sketchbook. It's available at jeremy.net. You can get some bonus videos and bonus blog posts at patreon.com slash jeremy. You can preview and read some of my comics at comics.jeremy.net. And you can buy some at amazon.jeremy.net. That's it for now. Subscribe, like, share, and go be creative.